The Joint Commission on Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations mandates that institutions address ethical issues related to patient care and requires that health professionals be educated about ethics. This involves being aware of the ethical implications inherent in their work and being able to develop a philosophically consistent values-based framework upon which to base decision making. It starts with understanding some fundamental principles. Ethics stems from morality. Morals involve a basic sense of right and wrong, good and bad, notions that affect the human conscience. Things like respect, freedom and love are considered moral concepts. How are you feeling? A lot better today. My leg hasn't been bothering as much lately. In fact, a nurse's own motivation to care for others is usually generated by a moral perspective. Morals inspire rules of action. These are called ethics. Our policy supports the ethical standards of protecting our patients' dignity in any way we can. That's why we provide privacy during the personal care of Mr. Jones, even though he's in a coma and not aware of his environment. I see. It demonstrates respect for him as a person. Ethics applies to the application of morals, which become the accepted rules and norms and an integral part of nursing. A term that is sometimes used interchangeably with healthcare ethics is bioethics. Bioethics specifically focuses on the moral aspects of healthcare and originally grew out of a concern with life and death issues. We've called this meeting of the Bioethics Committee in response to a nursing request for an ethics consultation on Mr. Ernest Jones. Mr. Jones has no advanced directives in place and the two sons are in strong disagreement about life support. Issues like advanced directives, organ and tissue recovery and donation, and informed consent are common topics of discussion. And an ethics committee is very valuable in terms of everybody sitting down and trying to arrive at a solution with a multitude of different perspectives. There are many principles used when discussing bioethics. Beneficence is one of them. It refers to taking action to promote the welfare of others. Set aside about 15 minutes so that we can go over this. Mercy, kindness, and charity are all qualities of beneficence. The term non-malfeasance is related to beneficence. It essentially means do no harm. This is an overriding principle for all patient care. You want to do whatever is, is in the patient's best benefit and do no harm. Um, Part of that also includes intent to do no harm. We can also do emotional harm, and we can do emotional harm through not necessarily malice of forethought, but by providing culturally insensitive care, not being aware of perhaps what the patient thinks or how the patient feels. Respect for persons is fundamental. There are many ways to demonstrate this. One way is through honoring a person's autonomy. Autonomy literally means self-governing, having freedom to make choices about one's life. Mr. Benson, so you wanted to talk to me? Yes, I've been thinking about my surgery and I really think I need a second opinion. My wife agrees with me and I want to postpone the surgery until we get it. Okay, sure, well you have every right to a second opinion. Um, I'll go ahead and let your doctor know. Do you have any idea who you would want to see? In nursing, there are many implications with autonomy, such as informed consent, advanced directives, and end-of-life issues. Respecting a patient's privacy is an important ethical principle. One means of achieving this is through the practice of confidentiality. Yes, I, I realize you want the data, but I can't give out information about other patients without their consent. I'm sorry, ma'am, it's just confidential. Respect. It's a basic value that confirms the inherent dignity, worth, and uniqueness of every individual. In healthcare settings, treating others with compassion and respect is an important ethical standard, but not always as simple as it might appear. Complex medical scenarios, issues of autonomy and staff shortages are just some of the challenges now facing caregivers, along with the fact that we're all simply human. It makes it much more difficult to um,
decide uh, how to provide care to patients, still do uh, what we as hospitals are obligated to do while operating in this uh, marketplace of diminishing resources. The nurse in all professional relationships practices with compassion and respect for the inherent dignity, worth, and uniqueness of every individual. Unrestricted by considerations of social or economic status, personal attributes, or the nature of health problems. Dignity refers to the quality of being worthy of esteem or respect. Basic respect for human dignity can be expressed in so many ways as healthcare professionals go about their daily work. Okay, it's ringing. Thank you. Hello? For the bedside nurse, it might be through small gestures, such as assisting the patient to place a phone call or helping with putting on a robe for visitors. Or be expressed in larger ways, like assuring that patients understand the explanations given to them by physicians when securing informed consent. So I want to make sure that you fully understand what that sentence means. On a basic level, respect is an expression of the golden rule of treating others how one would like to be treated themselves. In nursing, this means taking into account the needs and values of not only patients and their families, but of one's colleagues as well. It goes beyond just being able to identify how it feels to be the patient, but rather taking a, a step further on being the patient and being the patient surrounded by you. The codes of ethics look carefully at relationships to patients. There, we're finished. As the need for health care is universal, it should transcend all individual differences. How was it? Oh, it was great. Mark had already seen it before. So this means delivering care without judgment of patients' race, religion, or lifestyle. Respecting another's value system and religious beliefs, even if they're quite foreign to one's own. They, they just think I'm crazy. I've personally never experienced anything like that before, but I think I could get a sense of why you might feel that way. Suspending judgmental thinking is easier than it sounds. I think the most important thing, especially for new nurses, to recognize is that we're all going to have our own feelings and biases about what should be the outcome. But in fact, the patient and the patient's family need to be the determiners of care and need to be the, the individuals who are satisfied with the outcome. You always impart a part of you, a part of your own values, whenever you administer care. And when we administer care, is it a matter of because we believe that's the kind of care or is it for the best interest of our patients? In planning, respect is expressed by taking the patient's culture into account, especially as it pertains to things like dietary preferences, communication styles, and other unique cultural variables. I can totally understand where the patient is coming from. In my family, we just don't make health decisions on our own. Same with my family many cultures, health decisions are not made by an individual, but by a group, a family, community, or the society at large. So every aspect of what we do for patients is really bound up in their culture, their values, and recognition of that and understanding of what their values are um, makes a big difference in being able to navigate the healthcare system safely and appropriately for that patient. Commitment. For those working in the field of health care, it's an essential principle. One that not only impacts quality of care, but can make the difference between life and death. Within this commitment, nurses need to know what the professional boundaries are, what constitutes a conflict of interest, and how to work more collaboratively. With hospitals becoming more like marketplaces and ethical issues getting more complex every day, Understanding and maintaining one's commitment can be a challenge. They know they need to spend more time with the patient. They know they need to talk to them more. They know they need to provide support, moral support and emotional support to the patient. But the reality is the time for that is very limited. The nurse's primary commitment is to the patient, whether an individual, family, group, or community. 
The privacy of the patient's interest is clearly emphasized here. Well, I understand completely, Mrs. Perkins. You know what I'll do? I'll call Dr. Knowles and I'll ask him about changing the dosage on your medication to what you were taking at home and see if that helps. I'd appreciate that. I know how busy you all are. Oh, no worries. It's okay. That's what we're here for. There's an inherent or potential vulnerability in individuals who need health care, and it's the nurse's responsibility to work for the patient's behalf as a moral agent and advocate. Advocacy refers to the formal or informal activities of a nurse that uphold the rights of the patient to receive safe care. Advocacy also means to empower the patient to act on his or her own behalf. This involves care that meets the unique and comprehensive needs of the individual and his or her family. His wife has learned all the dressing procedures, but she works full time. Is there anyone available to help during the day? His sister has expressed willingness and she's home during the day. If they're comfortable having her help out, perhaps that could be the solution. I'll see how they feel about that. And recognizing the patient's place in the family and other networks. A good plan of care must reflect this uniqueness. You have to individualize your care. You can't go in and treat every patient the same. You just can't because not every person is the same. Sometimes it's the patient's goals and the family goals may be in conflict. There again, we need to have some good, clear communication and get some clarity on primarily what the patient's goals might be. In some critical care situations, a greater chance exists that patients and families may have limited or no decision-making capacity. So we need to get Mr. Graves transferred to the floor in the next hour. I'll go make sure he understands that he's ready to leave the ICU and see how we can make this as easy as possible for him. During this time, the nurse's responsibility is to work on the patient's behalf and serve diligently as a moral agent and advocate, providing safe passage through the health care continuum. But keeping the patient as the nurse's primary commitment when so many take part in the care can be a challenge. It is rare for nurses not to talk to any of the physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy physician in the course of a shift, in the course of a day. And these are just addressing patient needs. Patient advocacy is accomplished through the interdependence of nurses in differing roles and working to make sure that all relevant parties are involved and have a voice in the decision making. Naturally, some conflict is inevitable. When conflicts do arise, a nurse's commitment is again to act as an advocate for the patient. Look, I think that we really need to take a longer look at Mr. Connor's lack of progress. I think it's because he tells the doctor that he feels fine when he's still in a lot of pain. I talked to his doctor about it yesterday and he left without giving me any new orders. Well, I'll give Dr. Soames a call again. I just don't want this man getting lost in the shuffle. This means actively addressing issues and working towards solutions. There are various ways to address concerns of the patient, the family, or the team itself. These include discussions to update and reevaluate goals of care, interdisciplinary team meetings, ethics consultations, and mediation. The therapeutic relationship that exists between nurses and their patients requires that the needs of the patient in the interest of the nurses not be in conflict. Such conflicts are a serious violation of a nurse's commitment to patients and their families. I really can't do that. It would be a conflict of interest for me to recommend my husband's company as his medical equipment supplier. Nurses need to be vigilant in assessing for and identifying instances where conflict of interest might occur. I, I can't do that. This means avoiding situations that can give rise to actual or even perceived conflicts of interest. Some examples are actions that result in financial benefit to the nurse or personal loss to the patient or the use of confidential information to exploit or coerce the patient. 